Welcome to Tent Talk, the podcast with Nancy McCrady, where we talk about life under the big tent of God's presence and the provoking process of discipleship. Here we go. Hey, everybody, welcome to Tent Talk. This is Nancy McCrady. On today's episode, I encourage you to take a good, strong listen to chapter 12 from the book Ultimate Intention. It's entitled, What the Cross Realizes for God. My friends, we must, we must know this truth. So, take a listen, and I pray that it takes you deeper with Him, for Him, in Him, unto Him. He must be the center and focus. It's the only way the new man was given to live. Take a listen. And you will come to know the distinctions between the old rugged cross full of power and the new cross that unfortunately is preached so much in the church today that doesn't bring man to the end of self and unto God. It takes man deeper into him being his own center. Love you all. Let me see if I can bring together so many thoughts uh, that I am having uh, in these days. Uh, I am recording this early, early on the morning that it's being posted, June 1, 2022. And I have been, uh, over the last 24 hours, in meetings to bring Cross Encounter Uh, which is a premier discipleship project of Nancy McCready Ministries, uh, stronger into Europe, and was in meetings with those that are going to host uh, and make it possible for many sons to be returned to the Father. And so we were in logistical meetings and just what it takes to Uh, really be able to do cross-encounter behind the scenes and make it possible for people to really enter into the deep hospitality of God uh, and into that very, very simple uh, discipleship event, for lack of a better word. Um, And then also, I just did a live, the first part of a two-part live series called The Viewpoint, uh, based on what I've been sharing for years and years that radically, radically transformed my own life uh, about 25, 26 years ago. And uh, that coming together with uh, some of the freshest research data that's coming out of Barna Research Uh, And it's just invigorating me uh, in my assignment. And so in thinking on those things um, that I'm involved in and just in the daily ebb and flow of the work here at Nancy McCready Ministries, I'm back looking at Chapter 12 in one of uh, my all-time... book recommendations, um, Ultimate Intention by Deverne Fromke. So what I'm going to do today is simply read this chapter to you because sometimes people just say it so well that you just wonder why would I need to add to it, right? Now, of course, you know, I'll probably have moments where I will um, speak uh, and embellish (laughs) <laughs> is that the word that we would use that that I probably, you know, will want to add something in or make a comment. But for the most part, I want to read this because most people have never heard of the book. Uh, if they have, they've tried to read it, but um, they say it's too difficult to understand. Uh, and I certainly understand that because I had mentors in my life that gave me this book before I heinously sinned against the Lord in my very, very good, uh, sober ministry flesh. Um, but I guarantee you that when I was in this very dark place that I created, 
uh, in my uh, open rebellion to God. I guarantee you that when I pulled this book off the shelf in the timing of God, um, it became bedrock to me uh, and took me into the scripture uh, in a way and forever um, transformed my worldview and brought me to a biblical worldview, uh, a, a, a view from the Father's uh, perspective, from reality, the greatest reality ever. So chapter 12 uh, opens up and says, the more we become accustomed to seeing from his viewpoint and thinking after his thoughts, the more we want to emphasize what God realizes for himself through the cross. Once we saw the blood as it meant forgiveness for us, but now we see more. It is the ground on which the father can enjoy fellowship with his children. Once we saw our union in Christ's death and resurrection as the basis for our victory, now we want to emphasize what the cross realizes for God. In the first eight chapters of Romans, two aspects of salvation are presented. Justification by the blood and deliverance through the cross. This is a most important distinction for alas, many believers have wandered in defeat for many years because they do not know or reckon on union in death with Christ on the cross. While we must be careful to recognize that Christ's finished work at Calvary is one complete work from God's standpoint, yet it is finished in the individual believer only as he reckons on its efficacy and allows the truth to become operative in his life. Let us see how this works. In Adam, in Christ. God deals with the human race through two representative men, Adam and Christ. A simple illustration will demonstrate the principle involved. By planting one kernel of corn, harvesting every kernel, and replanting year after year without destroying or using any of the corn, it would be possible to produce so much corn within 20 years that there would be no room for human life on the earth. Every grain of corn would have its beginning in the first tiny kernel. This is what Paul speaks of in Romans five twelve through 21 when he explains that we all had our beginning in the first Adam. Through him, sin and death have come upon the human race. But through Christ comes the new creation, wherein is righteousness, his righteousness. Another illustration of this truth is found in Hebrews, where the writer shows how Levi was in Abraham's loins when he paid tithes to Melchizedek. As the father of a family, Abraham is seen to include the whole family in himself. In making his offering, he included with himself all his seed. So it is that God sees two family trees, Adam's family and Christ's family. If our source of life is to change, it becomes evident that above all, one thing must happen. We must change families. Since we are born into Adam's family, how can we get out? How can we become disentangled from the wretchedness of our inheritance through him, Adam? There is only one way to be freed, that is through death. By union with Christ, the last Adam, in his death, God sets us free from the tyrants who reign over Adam and his posterity. God not only speaks of the first and last Adam, but also of the first and second man. The realization that there would never be another Adam brought to me a wonderful unveiling of truth. When the Lord Jesus was crucified on the cross, he was nailed there and laid in the tomb as the last Adam. All, all that was in the first Adam was gathered up and done away in him, in Christ. In God's reckoning, Adam was left in the grave. We were included there. 
By Jesus' death, the old race was completely wiped out. Do you see it? There will never be another Adam. As Christ, the last Adam, moved into death, he carried the whole family into the grave, and God pronounced the end. But in the second man, he brings forth the new race by the resurrection. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. This is quoted from 1 Corinthians fifteen forty-seven through 49. Now by one master stroke, God has provided death to the old and the earthy. But he has provided life through the second man, the Lord Jesus, who becomes the life source of the new heavenly creation. Through death, burial, and resurrection, we pass from the old family tree into a new family tree. We are no longer in Adam, but are now in Christ. In this new position, God considers us beyond the claims of old tyrants and under his new government. What God counts as true of our position, we must appropriate as true in our life and walk. What a day it is when we recognize all that he designed to accomplish through the cross. In it, God has liberated Adam's race from four reigning tyrants, death, sin, the law, and the flesh. Paul gives us this bird's eye view in the middle chapters of Romans. Chapter 5, freedom from sin's penalty, death. Chapter 6, freedom from sin's tyranny, bondage. Chapter 7, freedom from sin's strength, the law. Chapter 8, freedom from sin's presence when we receive the redemption of the body. Paul emphasizes that being moved positionally from Adam into Christ is more, much more than having a new family position. In Adam, we receive all that was of Adam as the life source. Now in Christ, we are to receive everything that is of Christ, our new life source. God intends this new life to be more than a position or a crisis experience. It is to be a new way of living, a new purpose for existence. Thank God the hour has come when he is making his manner and purpose of life effectual in more of his children than ever before. But just here, men so often take a detour and miss the key which will surely open the way of life unto God. The important key. Many times in the Past 15 years of ministering in Bible conferences, folks have confessed to me, we have tried to make the truth of identification with Christ in death and resurrection real in our lives. Yet in spite of all our knowing, reckoning, and yielding, it hasn't seemed to bring reality. It has not brought the victory and blessing which we sought. As I listen, the problem becomes evident. Their very words reveal it. Without realizing the truth, these people are far more concerned for themselves than for Him, for God. They are far more alive to what they want God to do for them than what they might become unto Him. If they could They would use God and the work of the cross for their own ends. Here is the source of their trouble. The cross is not the threshold to selfish attainment, but a terminal to selfishness. Many would use it for themselves, but God has designed that it should bring men wholly unto himself. Even among those who continually attend deeper life conferences and retreats, we find many who have fallen victim of this vicious snare. 
After years and years of reckoning on more knowledge and deeper teaching, they are still camping around their old self-center, getting all God has for me, possessing all my possessions, appropriating all my inheritance in Christ. Oh, May God shatter the veneer and uncover every attempt at using the cross instead of dying on the cross. Hidden behind most begging and pleading for God to give victory is the secret concern for ourselves, not Him. God will not condone this self-centeredness. How many years I taught the truths of Romans 6 and counseled with those who were in defeat and bondage before I found this key. In his death, I am to become alive unto God. As long as a believer's primary concern is to get victory or deliverance, it means that in a subtle way, he continues to live unto self. Four times in four verses in Romans 6, God emphasizes that the key is living unto God. Verse 10, liveth unto God. Verse 11, alive unto God. Verse 13, yield yourselves unto God. Verse 13, as instruments unto God. What does God intend this to mean in actual practice? Simply that the primary thing is, he will realize through the cross is to change man's old center and purpose of living and bring him unto himself and his ultimate intention. Here is the ancient law. When we seek him first, then all these things will be added. The very moment one becomes alive unto God, the door has opened for God, for him, to accomplish victory and full deliverance. Two families and two trees. On the blackboard, this is a diagram that's in the book, but on the blackboard we have pictured the two families and their corresponding trees. One is the family in Adam and the other is the family in Christ. All who have their source in the life of Adam have followed in his selfish way by living unto their own purpose and plans. Now through the cross, God has laid the axe to the root of the old family line in order that he might move man into a new family and life unto God. Such a life is from a new source. One glance at our modern emphasis would teach us that Satan's methods have not changed one whit since the garden. He is still offering the same substitute for the tree of life. Today, it is a modern cross in place of the old rugged cross. In an earlier book, now out of print, we quoted A.W. Tozer, quote, The new cross says come and get, and a selfish human would be entirely contrary to his own nature if he refused. Of course he will use the cross by his own benefits and for his own benefits. Whereas the old rugged cross says come and give, and for the moment entirely ignores anything that the individual shall receive, save a baptism unto death. And why does the old cross demand so much? Simply because from the beginning God has only intended that this Christian life shall be based on this one principle. The new life is lived not unto self, but unto God. 2 Corinthians 5.14 Whereas the old cross was meant by God to be the symbol of death and detachment from the old Adam life, this new substitute cross does not intend to slay the sinner, but just redirect him. It gears him into a cleaner, jollier way of living and saves his self-center and ambition. To the self-assertive, it says, come and assert yourself for Christ. To the religious egotist, it says, come and do your boasting in the Lord. To the thrill-seeker, it says, come and enjoy the thrill of Christian fellowship. 
the modern message is slanted in the direction of the current vogue, thereby catering to human taste and reasoning. The old cross would have no track with the world. For Adam's proud flesh, it meant the end of the journey. It carried into effect the sentence imposed by the law of Sinai. The new cross is not opposed to the human race, rather it is a friendly pal, and if understood aright, it is the source of oceans of good, clean fun, and innocent enjoyment. It lets Adam live without interference. His life motivation is unchanged. He still lives for his own pleasure, only now he takes delight in singing choruses and watching religious movies instead of singing body songs and drinking hard liquor. The accent is still on enjoyment, though the fun is now on a higher plane morally, if not intellectually. If this was true 15 years ago when it was first written, how much more it is true today. One need only watch the converts of this new cross to realize that they have never had a changed center through union with Jesus in death on the old rugged cross. But what is more alarming is that even our deeper life conferences have become victims, unconsciously I trust, of this new philosophy and technique. To be sure, the new cross approach has become popular because it has slipped in all unannounced and all undetected. On the surface, it appears to use the vocabulary of the old rugged cross, yet the likenesses are superficial while the differences are fundamental. The new cross offers a living unto self. The old cross points to the heavenly way of living unto God. The Holy Spirit must reveal. I shall never forget one Sunday night several years ago when we were speaking about these two family trees. In using the blackboard I had spoken from Romans 11, using God's description of how the Gentiles of the wild olive tree were grafted into the good olive tree so that they might become partakers of new life from the good tree. Of course, I showed how this portion of Scripture directly applied to God's cutting Israel off and grafting in the Gentiles. Yet I showed how the principle applies to God cutting us off from the old family of Adam and through death moving us into Christ. In him we have a new root, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. How often the Holy Spirit accomplishes more in one instant of revelation than in years of preaching or teaching. It was so that very night. Suddenly, the dear pastor's wife stood to her feet and walked to the front, tears coursing down her cheeks as she told how God had been speaking to her for days about living from the source and in the bondage of the old Adam life. Then she explained, God could never have spoken more directly to me about my wild olive living. Turning to me, she said, others knew, but you didn't. My first name is Olive. And these people know all too well how much of my life has been from the source of the old wild olive. During five weeks of ministry in that church, the Holy Spirit graciously liberated many who had been living from the old family tree. Now, by a real union in death and resurrection, they moved into a new family and purposeful living unto God. In God's planning, then, the cross and the crucified one have become the gateway to life. Apart from this gateway, there can be no movement on the highway of realizing God's purpose. While we are not unmindful of the pit from whence we have been digged, not the rock to which we have come, we do not linger in preoccupation with these. We move ever forward to realize the purpose for which we have been called to sonship. We shall always sing about 
the precious blood, glory in the cross, and exult in his life. But what previously have been crises will now become a walk forward and upward in fulfilling his ultimate intention. This is truly life, a new kind of life in a wholly different sphere. Death has yielded its throne to the higher law of love. The flesh has yielded its throne to the spirit. All this is what the cross has realized for God. Wow. I pray that you would listen to this and meditate upon this for your self. Oh, my friends, plan A is definitely still on. And God has done everything necessary to bring you back home to him. That's the whole point of Cross Encounter. It is to reveal our independence from him that came by way of Adam and to reveal the glorious work finished on the cross by Jesus Christ himself. And when it is imparted to us by Holy Spirit, according to Galatians 4, 4 through 7, it is to confer sonship upon us that we might cry out, Abba, Father. Come home, sons, in Christ to the Father. Take your seat at his table. Meditate upon this truth and allow Holy Spirit to make every bit of it real inside of you for the day and hour in which you live. I love you all. Again, I've read today from the Ultimate Intention book by Deverne Fromke, Chapter 12, What the Cross Realizes for God. For more information on Nancy, please visit nancymccrady.com or follow her on social media at nbmccrady.com.